Hello and welcome to your favourite teacher. Today I'm just going to talk through um, a little bit about chapter two of Animal Farm. So if you haven't listened yet, go back and listen to that podcast where I read chapter two. So we learn quite a lot. Um, obviously it starts with the death of Old Major and the animals begin to sort of put his theory into practice and prepare for the rebellion. The pigs have kind of taken control here and we learn quite a lot about the pigs, largely the fact that we no, no longer really have the animals all being equal because these pigs can read and write. So they've taken the initiative and they are in charge of the revolution. Um, their names are quite significant because we learn this a bit more about them. So Snowball, well, when we think of like a snowball effect, something that grows and grows... Um, Napoleon, we already know, um, has connotations as of being, you know, powerful. Um, and then we've got Squealer, which, and we, and we know that he seems to be the sort of persuasive one. So maybe he's like the mouthpiece of the pigs. Um, and he, uh, he seems to, they say that he has some difficult point. He is able to convince people by sort of skipping around from side to side so he's obviously very persuasive and perhaps he uses this wagging of the tail as a certain bit of propaganda um <clears throat> the the pigs are obviously the cleverest and actually because they have the they have their sort of trotters they're able to do some of the things that men can do and that's going to be a really important thing to look out for now the rebellion is hugely successful and you know the animals it just sort of happens um it says with one accord and chase jones from the farm they they all kind of unite to end their oppression after the revolution most of the animals are on board but not all of them are some of them have this quote duty of loyalty to Jones and, and some of them are afraid that without Jones they're going to starve or Molly for example doesn't want to lose her sugar um actually talking of Molly we learn a bit more about her we know that she likes um she sort of disappears and she's stuck in the well she keeps herself in the room and ties another ribbon in her hair and so she's very reluctant to move on from the more glamorous sides of life We've also got the issue of Moses um, and his story about Sugarcane Mountain. Now, Moses has religious connotations. and um, This is a raven offering a story about a fictitious place. And it's a paradise. And lots of the animals are willing to believe that, um, believe in that idea of a utopia. So this is similar to the idea of, of heaven, perhaps, um, that Orwell's um, pointing out. And we've got, again, undertones of communism. Um, Karl Marx has a famous quote about religion being the opium of the masses, which means that religion is able to keep people downtrodden because um, they believe that they are going to go to a better place. And so any suffering that you have now, don't fight against it because it will all be okay in the end and so some of the animals kind of adopt this policy and they are, they want to believe that this farm um this place in the sky is is going to be brilliant um everyone really has the idea that things are going to be okay whether it's in this place in the sky or whether it's on this new animal farm and the renaming um, obviously signifies the, the triumph that they've had over their enemy, but also it, it suggests that they all believe that this is going to be a new place, a new type of farm. We have all of the symbols of, of humankind uh, being destroyed. So um, the nose rings, dog chains, etc. they get burnt, thrown down the well, things like that. Um, and one of the things that's really significant here I found towards the end was the milk um, and when I was reading it and we have so the, the pigs have, have milked the cows and everyone's saying oh what should we do with the milk and um, you know should you know, um, 
one of one of the animals says oh we'll have it mixed in and pig's like don't worry just go go to work we need to do the harvest don't you worry about the the milk and when they come back at the end of the hard day's work the milk has mysteriously vanished so we have you know we're assuming that the pigs have had it themselves um we've got the seven commandments which is just far too similar to the biblical 10 commandments to not mention so more religious connotations here um they identify the code of conduct that everyone should abide um so it'll be interesting to see if they are going to be broken by the pigs because we know that the pigs have set themselves as separate to the rest of the animals um and that perhaps it's not all equal after all um one of the things to really note from chapters one and chapter two when we carry on reading is whether this rebellion is going to have been a success now yes it has been a success that they've achieved it and they might be in this sort of euphoric state right now where as with anything it's like i can't believe we've we've actually overthrown whoever um but we need to notice and again with this you know idea of revolution that um, Orwell is obviously referring to. We need to draw historical links to the Russian Revolution and the idea of overthrowing power and um, this illusion of equality that actually is really quite hard to put into practice. Um, And that's something that we're going to have to watch out for as we carry on reading. So chapters one and chapter two are down and eight more to go.